Max, about time. Yes. So now that we are usually a little more flexible about time, but we have a really incredible community of speakers uh, who uh, want to share their insights and visions and reflections about uh, posthumanism and COVID-19. So we're going to be really strict on time, starting 12.01, okay, one minute off, but almost perfectly on time. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, everyone, for being here with us. It's a great honor and joy and delight to be all together. Uh, thanks all the speakers uh, for agreeing to be part of this event. Uh, thanks uh, Jim McBride, McBride and uh, Julian Boylan for co-hosting this event with me. Thanks so much uh, NYU Liberal Studies for helping with this organization. And thanks all of you who are connecting from across the globe. I know that some of you are in the middle of the night, in the morning, the evening. So it's really precious to be here all together. And I would also like to send uh, you uh, our presence uh, and appreciation and energy in this uh, delicate historical moment. We know that some of, uh, of us are going through some challenging uh, times with COVID-19. And uh, so we are, we are here together. We are rethinking of the human condition together. So you're not alone in this uh, and, uh, and we're here for you. And we're going to have some uh, more meetings to make sure that the community is together in this delicate moment. Okay, we do have a bunch of announcements before we go into our uh, discussion. I also want to mention that I know that some of you have uh, impelling announcements that you want to uh, shut out for the globe. So we, at the end of the meeting, we're going to have 10 minutes for all kinds of announcements. I know that some of you are working on projects on posthumous COVID-19, call for papers on all of these. Wait, at the end of the meeting, uh, we're going to have the last 10 minutes, uh, 1.20 to 1.30, just for this kind of announcement. I also want to like to mention that uh, um, we do have a mailing list where we have upgraded our uh, digital uh, means because of COVID-19. So we are not going to host uh, physical meetings at the moment. Uh, so if you can join our mailing list on our website, posthumans.org. Uh, I would appreciate it. Maybe Julian or something can just uh, type it in our chat. Um, and we also have a blog on COVID-19 and the posthuman. Uh, it's, very, uh, it's very alive, uh, we have weekly entries. Uh, actually, a lot of the people who are, I see connected have actually also uh, sent us a blog for us, for entry for us. Uh, so just uh, for you to know, you can send us your uh, videos, your images, pictures, text uh, to uh, nyposthuman at gmail.com. Again, it's uh, a blog on uh, posthumanism and COVID-19 and it's very, very active. Uh, and uh, let me just uh, uh, send later on both links in our chat. Uh, also, I would like to announce that we have a podcast coming out, Posthumans, with Julian Boylan. So if you're also interested in uh, organizing with us an event uh, connected to the podcast, please let us know. We have a YouTube channel that is co-organized by Stefan Lorenz Orgner and Jaime Del Val, who are our speakers here. They can talk more about it. It's called Posthumans Go Viral. My book is coming out on June 28 as a paperback. I know that it was very expensive last year, so I'm very happy that now it's uh, affordable. Uh, so uh, Philosophical Posthumanism, uh, Bloomsbury, you can find it on Amazon or on Bloomsbury. Also, we have a Posthuman Chinese Forum coming up with some uh, people organizing it. I would like to thank Celine and Joanna, who are also connected. If you and Charles, if you're interested in being part of the Posthuman Chinese Forum, we have already a core of, uh, of people working on this. Uh, please send us a private chat uh, and we can connect you with the uh, editor and organizers. Um, okay, all these are announcements that are strictly directed, connect, directly connected to the Posthuman Global, uh, to the global Posthuman Network. Now, Talk about us, talking about our meeting, netiquette. Please uh, make sure that you're going to be respecting time, which means speakers, five minutes. Uh, people who are asking questions, one minute. People at the end who is going to announce uh, their amazing project, one minute. Netiquette, please be polite, stay on topic. Simple, simple etiquette, but it's very important. If you do not agree with someone, great. We're all here because we're all different, but do it with kindness and, and politeness. We're going to record this meeting. So these are also very important. We're going to share this meeting on different social medias, YouTube, uh, Facebook, uh, podcast, blog. So if there is any uh, reason that you don't want to be appearing in the uh, recordings, please let, let us know. Huh? Uh, also, Q&A. We're going to host this meeting this way. We're going to have three speakers. Then we're going to have uh, um, the Q&A. 
the Q and A means that you are going to send your question through the little uh, note at the at the bottom that you're going to see called Q and A. If you have a specific question, just type your question. If you have a comment, I know that a lot of you are amazing thinkers and you might just want to comment on these uh, ideas or criticize or whatever, right? I have a comment and you can place parentheses, I don't know, uh, something just to clarify what will be your, your topic about. So we'll try to go in a fluid but connected way. So the, the Q&A is going to be long, 20 minutes, because this is a forum. This is not just a conference. It's a forum where we give insights and input to have your feedback. We are in this together. And this should be also be very clear in the way we do it. Uh, last thing, um, you can also chat with, with individuals. I know that some of you know each other and now we're all scattered all over the world. So if you want to say to someone, how are you doing? You can do it privately in the chat. You can just choose their name and say, hi, I haven't seen you since the last New Year Postuma meeting. How are you doing? You can do that. Feel free to do it. This is a community as well. Check on others, absolutely fine. Um, and the timekeepers, we're going to have Julian Bolin, who is going to be kindly reminding everyone the time is happening. We are in space time. We are manifesting in this dimension. So he's going to do two bells for you. If you're a speaker, he's going to do the soft bell after four minutes and a little more. That's it, which is also for me because I have to stop my talk because it's already four minutes of myself. And then the second one is a little more intense. Julia, what is the second uh, bell? Exactly, and these also go for participants. So if you are going to uh, ask a question and you get so excited and passionate and you go on, it's beautiful, but you can go on writing more notes in the chat, but to share with everyone, you have one minute. So after 40 seconds, you're going to, going to hear a gentle kind of thing, and then a little more of an intense, okay, thank you, but it's time to move on. All right, so again, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for being here. Uh, if you want to give us uh, some, uh, some presence, you can, you know, uh, there are ways you can clap. There are some ways you can use, uh, uh, you know, to, to be participating. But again, uh, voice-wise, we're going to go uh, wait until the Q&A and then general announcements connecting to posthumanism at the very end of the meeting. I think I said everything. And if I didn't, uh, I will have some more time, one minute for myself later on. So again, thank you so much, everyone, for connecting. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. One last announcement. We're also working on a Latin American posthuman um, uh, summit. So if you're interested in that, it's going to be in Spanish, uh, not only, but the Spanish, indigenous languages, uh, Portuguese, English. So if you're interested in Latin America and the posthuman, also you can write me, you can write uh, nyposthuman at, at gmail.com saying Latin American uh, network. Uh, and so on. So again, Chinese network going on, post Latin American network going on, and also there are some events uh, connected to Postumanism in India. So if you are some of interested in this, let us know. Anyway, or if you have more uh, ideas, uh, please uh, share it with us. You can dev definitely have a space on our uh, global Postuman network. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here together today. It's been an amazing, an amazing possibility. Thanks to Zoom also for giving us the option to connect live uh, together these days. Uh, we, we, we are so proud of this community. We love you all. And let's get into the insights of the philosophical and political implications of COVID-19 and the posthuman. My name is Francesca Ferrando. I am the director of the uh, Global Posthuman Network, and I'm extremely honored to be with this incredible uh, group of uh, thinkers. Thank you so much. Jim, you're muted. My fault. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is Jim McBride. Uh, I'm a member of the New York Post Human Research Group, and we wanted to move on to the presentations. The first presentation is why it is helpful and dangerous to use AI to fight COVID uh, by uh, Dr. Kevin Legrandeur, who is professor at the New York Institute of Technology and a fellow of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technology. He's also a co-founder of the New York Post uh, Human Research Group. Dr. Le Grandeur has published over 50 articles in several media productions, which have appeared in both professional venues and the popular press. His recent books are Artificial Slaves and Surviving the Machine Age. Thank you, Jim. Um, so, 
There's been a flood of tech innovations lately for fighting the COVID virus. Some are AI based and some of those are really good. However, a number of them are ethically problematic. First, let's talk about uh, some examples of the good ones like daily check using Alexa. This AI based diagnostic application for Amazon's Alexa automatically includes a questionnaire for seniors to see if they have COVID. It alerts a designated caregiver so privacy is protected and testing is ubiquitous, quick and persistent. It also serves a population, seniors, that's often hard to reach. Another good one with seemingly little downside is Google's use of its AI called DeepMind to predict more quickly the protein structure of COVID. This helps scientists to develop cure, cures. Um, the, problem, the problematic innovations are AI-based applications used for tracking and isolating people with the virus. There are wearable studies, for instance, uh, with fitness devices like my, my Fitbit. The biggest of these is done by, uh, being done by Scripps Institute. It gathers data from digital health devices like Fitbits and Apple Watches and transmits it to a central healthcare program. The data shared includes that collected by any fitness monitor that you wear. It also may include, may include um, electronic medical records or EMRs. The big problems here are three. First, privacy. Um, according to the study, uh, Scripps Institute studies FAQ, you can't ever delete the data that you've given and the study keeps it indefinitely. So even though it's anonymized, this is not the best practice for subject security. If there's a mistake or a data breach, people's electronic medical records are vulnerable. The second problem is uh, a general problem with all medical databases these days, and that's a lack of strong cybersecurity. Like most businesses, uh, medical companies just don't devote enough attention and money to cybersecurity. The evidence for this is the rampant reports of breaches by hackers over the last five years of many companies. At hospitals, it's especially done with ransomware. The third problem is that, so even if Scripps is careful and suffers no breaches, the apps used like Fitbit and Apple Health to siphon data from subjects do send personal data to third parties uh, and what those parties do with information is often not as strictly controlled as it is with the first party software. So this also increases privacy risks. Um, a, another problem is authoritarian problems. Authoritarian governments or authoritarian elements within those governments are already investigating alternative uses of AI tracking made for COVID. Uh, China is a good example of that. They're already trying to figure out ways to use the COVID tracking apps for other things. Maggie Jung, I imagine we'll talk about that later. So I'm gonna finish by saying there are solutions to the dangers of AI used for fighting COVID. Scientists need to be more careful to consider downsides of what they make. And additionally, the responsible politicians who happen to be left in the world need to make regulations and laws that embody five key principles that I'm going to finish with. So the first principle is that the most privacy preserving data option should be used. So data anonymization, for instance. Um, second, the app should always be purpose limited, that is only for the coronavirus tracking. Third, voluntary participation should be mandatory, not mandated participation. So people should have a choice whether or not they participate in these apps. And fourth, transparency. There should be sharing and open access to the data and knowledge so all countries have access to everything. And the last thing is there should be time limits made for the app. The app should automatically stop working at the given time that the disease ends. Thank you very much. I'm gonna stop there. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, our next uh, presentation is a democratic usage of digital data by Stefan Lorenz Sorgner, who is a philosophy professor at John Cabot University in Rome and is director and co-founder of the Beyond Humanism Network. He's a fellow at the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. He's a research fellow at the UBA or UHA Institute for the Humanities at UHA uh, Women's University in Seoul and visiting fellow at the Ethics Center of the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena. So Stefan. Many thanks for that introduction. 
We are in a war for digital data. This comes out clearly in the current pandemic crisis. It particularly takes place between the US and China. In the US, primarily big companies collect the data and use it for their own financial flourishing. In China, the system is more efficient as a state has a right to collect all the digital data. What takes place in China is particularly interesting as here, a digital localization takes place. The internet has been associated with globalization. However, China goes local. Only data which corresponds to the local rules is, are accessible in China. This move enables the Chinese government to collect even more data than other institutions as they have the exclusive right to access Chinese di digital data while still being able to also collect digital data in the rest of the world. The US reacted with sanctions against Huawei. All these moves are part of the warfare for digital data. Europe, on the other hand, has not even realized that we are in this war. The digital does not play the same importance here as it does in the US or in China. Europe doesn't have a sufficiently well-developed digital infrastructure, has hardly any leading hard and software companies, and has extremely high costs for participating in the digital realm. The most problematic issue might be that Europe forbids the possibility of efficient data collection, which undermines the possibility of informed policymaking, economic flourishing, scientific innovations, and personal well-being. By stressing this issue in the context of the pandemic crisis, I wish to highlight the importance of digital data as a flourishing of a country is connected to using data. The central issue is how it is used and what it is used for. And this is the issue we need to focus on. Big companies in the US use it for their financial flourishing. China uses it for their economic growth and political stability. Europe undermines the possibility of data collection which will lead to its economic, political, and social decline. Instead of focusing on privacy, Europe should focus on the appropriate usage of data, the democratic usage of our demo digital data. This would be the case if the data was used for a purpose which is in the interest of the citizens. Humans have a great plurality of interests, yet most people are interested in an increased health span. Hence, by using the data, to at least partially cover the costs of a universal health insurance would be a democratic usage of digital data. It would not be expropriation as the data would be used in the interest of the people. What would be important, however, is that negative freedom, that means the absence of constraint, would be promoted significantly to undermine the possibility of illegitimate sanctions. This would enable the option of the greatest possible plurality of different lifestyles. Political sanctions are important and justified if a person directly harms another person, as in the cases of rape and murder. However, people should not be afraid to be sanctioned for acts where no such harm occurs. So freedom would have to be promoted significantly and the personalized digital data would have to be stored safely. In order to reduce the risk of abuse, the possibility of human access to digital data should be extremely limited. Algorithms should be primarily responsible for having access to and the processing of digital data. As such, the risk of abuse can be minimized. Humans can be corrupted more easily than algorithms. By allowing data collection for a democratic purpose and realizing plurality, we can have health, wealth, and freedom while abandoning digital privacy. I can understand anyone who does not feel comfortable with these reflections. I do not either. Yet so far, I have not yet heard a convincing counter argument. If you cherish a good standard of living, a well-functioning universal health insurance, and the legal option of living in accordance with your idiosyncratic desires, then this suggestion seems to me as an as good as it gets solution which considers the pragmatic affordances of our everyday lives. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Maggie uh, Chang. Uh, she's a, an international student uh, at NYU, uh, uh, based in Hong Kong and Shenzhen in China. 
Um, let's see, the title of her talk is Post-Human Technology During COVID-19. Maggie? Yeah, hi. Um, um, first, I just want to say thanks because uh, it is my great honor to talk here. And so I am going to focus more on my personal experience um, during this crisis and on, on how technology is applied both in mainland China and in Hong Kong, uh, and um, um, and um, post some questions about myself. So, um, yeah, I think I have a PowerPoint, and um, if I can show it now, it would be better. Yeah, right. Thanks. Um, so, next slide, please. Uh, there are a few uh, examples um, during this time. Um, for example, there are disinfection warrior, and we also use big data and tracking tools to detect hotspots of this pandemic. Um, and um, next slide, please. Um, so further, we also have pandemic drone, which is developing. Um, it is served to detect on um, people's um, body temperature on Earth to monitor future um, outbreak of the virus. And um, in mainland China, um, what they used is a QR code um, on public transportation. For example, when you get on a taxi, you could you could stand, scan this QR code. And so you will be registered on this taxi. Um, if future, um, if um, some passengers before you are um, confirmed to carry this virus, you would receive a notice based on the QR code you scanned. So uh, you would be notified that you might be um, exposed. Um, so you might also be infected. Uh, next slide, please. Um, however, um, in the meantime, surveillance technology is also used. So um, what Hong Kong um, government is doing here is um, if you are coming outside of the city into Hong Kong, you have to stay in a mandatory 14 days quarantine. And so um, once you enter into the city, you will be put on a surveillance bracelet. So on the left side is the bracelet I wore for the first time I entered Hong Kong. And when I left it and came back again, um, uh, it is interesting that I, I, within a month, they have already updated it to a version more like iWatch. And so both of the bracelets are um, connected to an app on the phone, which could use Bluetooth and GPS to detect where I am and to monitor whether I have left the place for my quarantine. So here, uh, next slide, please. So an ethical issue is raised here. Um, what is the right thing to do? Because we all know the surveillance technology and the mandatory quarantine is a violation of human rights. Um, but on the other hand, um, if you do not stay, um, if the government do not push a mandatory quarantine policy, more people will, more people might have to die, and on some of them might have died because of other people's fault. So um, here I think it is more of a trade-off between um, human rights and human life. So um, I am also wondering like, um, what are people thinking and um, what are other people's opinion on this thing. So that is basically my presentation. Thanks for listening. Thank, Thank you, so Maggie. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So um, uh, now we're at the point of doing our questions and answers. So if you look at that little Q&A box down at the bottom, uh, if you want to post questions, that would be very helpful. We have a question for Stefan. Shouldn't we promote universal longevity like Cordero and DeGray see it? Uh, expansion instead of healthcare per se. Countries with universal healthcare did not fare well as far as morbidity of the virus was concerned. That is to say, casualties per million inhabitants. 
uh, Stefan. Oh, I, I thought we collect three questions first, but I can directly uh, re respond. Um, yeah, we definitely sh um, should, well, we should promote universal longevity, but I wouldn't phrase it like that. I would rather focus on expansion of the health span because it's not just it's not just the duration of life which, uh, in which we're interested in. Um, however, how should we do this in the best possible way? Um, it, so far, that there is no like um, no like conflict between the various groups within a society, and the best possible way to realize it is by means of a universal health insurance, because most people um, are interested in or most people identify an increased health span with a better quality of life that's that's one of the few things we can say about about the good life um, everyone else has such an idiosyncratic con uh, conception that's why i think it's enormously important um, achievement which we should cherish and try to promote in all societies yeah let's see uh any opinions of the other speakers uh on that question if not, I can pose uh, a few other questions. Uh, one uh, was uh, uh, raised by Maggie's comments, and that is, is the Watch Like app only for the quarantine period? Uh, yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, it is, and I actually have the watch still here now. And so uh, we could just cut this watch and throw it away. So it is not for like permanent surveillance use. Okay. Uh, may, I, may I just comment on, on? Sure. Yeah, well, I actually completely oppose the idea of longevity. I think given the problem of overpopulation and the, the disease that the human is on the planet in terms of the problem that I will speak about later, I think I would rather advocate shorter lives, but a better quality lives. And that might also help the planet a little bit. Um, let's see, uh, there is yet another question, and that is, uh, uh, does uh, the post-human, in relation to what's presented today and known, uh, does this technology reinforce or de-enforce borders? Kevin, do, do you want to answer this question? Kevin, uh, Kevin, would you mind answering this question? I didn't realize that was for me. I thought that was for. It was uh, more general, but because we already Stefan and Maggie, uh, so okay. just to make a little bit. Um, well, I think the post-human in relation to what's presented today, what I presented, has to do more with privacy than anything else, um, which I think is a big issue in terms of borders, personal borders, um, for the post-human. I mean, the post-human, I think, uh, entails thinking about possibilities as well as problems. And one of the problems with increasing emerging technology and digital technology is privacy. So that's one of the things I was trying to key on today. Uh, could I remind everybody <clears throat> that uh, to post your questions on the Q&A, that would be helpful. We do have uh, a comment, and I would ask the speakers to respond to it. Uh, <clears throat> the comment is, I think we will have to create tools that guarantee people ownership of their data. These tools could complement blockchain technology with attribute-based encryption to provide the data owner with control over how their data is accessible and used. Do you think this can help build a reliable and privacy conscious digital society? I, I, have, a, I have an answer for that. I think uh, one of the things I, I was gonna talk about but didn't have time is that I think that your blockchain idea is a great idea. Um, Google and Apple have probably the most successful app that, that's been developed for um, contact tracing so far, according to most security experts, because it does, it only keeps data on your iPhone and it's private to the user of the iPhone unless you volunteer that information. So, and also your Bluetooth is on. So what happens is it only records how close you've been to other people over a period of time of two weeks. 
if you happen to get sick, you then can choose to make that data available from your phone, the proximity data, and that is then sent anonymously to a central database that other people who've been close to you will get an alert and they can choose to quarantine. So it's all very private, as private as this kind of thing can be. I think that's not bad. I think your idea is much better, but I think there's a lot of technology work that has to go on first. Mm, yes. And Gina, oh, let me if we can, uh, can I, yeah, because we are already 12.32, so with eight minutes left, do you mind reading maybe three questions together and then, sure. yeah, because also we have some more questions so in, mm -hmm. the, in the chat, just to make sure that we try to answer as many questions as, as, as we can. Right. Can, can I ask a tiny technical question? Is there, is there some time for announcements at the end or do we do it in our talks? Or? At the end. At the end, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Um, When does ethical action become unpredictable and adaptive and perform posthumanism? <clears throat> That's one question. The second is a question generally for the panel. Given the way the tracking technologies are developing, showing clusters and tracking the spread, might we make interesting proposals and arguments uh, for healthcare based not around individuals but as communities and networks. This would necessarily challenge privacy as traditionally understood, which is exactly what posthumanist thought also does. Would anyone like to respond? And I have one other question here for all the speakers. <clears throat> Where would one draw the line between individual privacy and the interests of society overall? For instance, if tracking one person means saving many, should a government not track the person? That's oh. a great question. <laughs> Sorry. It, it will always imply tracking many also. So, you know, it's never just one. I mean, the important issue is, is why should we cherish privacy? Why are we interested in privacy? And I don't think we're interested in privacy. Um, the, the important reasons for privacy are we fear the sanctions connected to the information, or uh, we think sort of the digital data is connected to our property. And I, I explained in my talk why both of these issues do not have to be serious counter arguments. Because if we use the digital data as a payment for our universal health insurance, then this wouldn't be an expropriation. If, if the digital data gets stored and processed by algorithms and pro with the diff making it difficult to, ex to be accessed by humans, then the fear of abuse is, is reduced. Um, and we need to make sure that um, sanctions only apply in serious circumstances, only if someone directly harms another person in the case of rape and murder. Otherwise, um, this information shouldn't be used. So if we don't fear sanctions, and if the data gets used in our interest so that a universal health insurance gets paid for, um, then we, we, would, we should give up privacy. Privacy is not in our interest. And the important thing is sort of concerning uh, Kevin's suggestion is sort of uh, the digital data is connected to enormous amount of power. Um, and, and so, in whose interest should that power be? Should it be in the interest of the big companies as it's in the US, in, in the interest of sort of a, a political organization as in China, or should it, shouldn't it be rather be in our interest? And that's why I suggest using this data to, to pay for universal health insurance. Can I just say something because it's very important. So uh, just to make clear, uh, we bring many different voices uh, because that's the richness of the discussion. And for instance, I, I'm, uh, I think that privacy is very important and I do care about privacy. Uh, just, I'm not one of the speakers, but I also want to give a little more of a comment that we do have a lot of different perspectives here. And when Stefan said, we don't care about privacy, I care a lot about privacy and I think it's very important. And I think it, that the problem here is that we know how society works and how often uh, we have uh, other layers of control that go with connected to, specific, to sharing specific kind of data. 
um, you know, I come from Italy, I come from a, a history that was uh, ingrained in fascism. So we, uh, we know that often data are used in different ways. Just to say that, you know, Stefan is a great opinion, but there are many other opinions here. And this we, it's uh, posthuman, it's, it's plural. Well, can, okay. can, I just add, can I just add that uh, privacy is a way of naming freedom. So if we have no privacy, you know, of course, we have to challenge the concept of privacy, which comes from maybe a biopolitical society or, you know, certain kinds of enclosure maybe are not what we are looking for. But uh, uh, I think some of us associate privacy to freedom. So no privacy would be no freedom. Okay. And the important thing I was... I was showing, or I've also shown in a different interview for the Immortalist magazine in more detail, that privacy and freedom are two independent concepts. Um, and they're independent if we don't have to fear illegitimate sanctions. Sort of the greatest amount of plurality should be legitimate. The greatest um, uh, uh, different types of um, uh, lifestyles should be possible but sanctions need to be the case in any kind of society, for example, in the case of murder. And that's why um, if we don't have to fear the sanctions, then this is the greatest amount of uh, freedom we can have. So freedom and privacy um, don't have to go along with each other. I also add to that that I just told somebody on Q&A on typing answers that privacy is, is a big difference uh, depending on which culture you're from. You know, um, some cultures don't value individuality and privacy as much as, say, Americans do. But that's why precisely, well, maybe I can expand on it later. Uh, that's precisely why I was claiming a different concept of privacy, which is the one associated to freedom and which is indissociable from freedom and where anything mm, undermining it will be a totalitarian or fascist undermining of freedom altogether. There, there is another question here that uh, bears on the same uh, uh, point, I think. Uh, let's see, the, the question is, as, as Kevin mentioned, authoritarian government poses risks from digital data uh, perspective. What does the neoliberal state, where does the neoliberal state stand in this debate? Because the state characteristics of the neoliberal state affects every decision. Um, well, I, I would say that, first of all, neoliberalism is just a renaming of laissez-faire capitalism. And, you know, we had that 100 years ago in the United States, and it didn't work out very well. So we're going through a second phase of that, as most people think, and it sounds like the questioner also thinks. I think that, you know, neoliberalism, that is laissez-faire capitalism, everything is for um, the capitalist and the bosses and nothing for the, the mass of humanity. So, um, you know, I think there's, yeah, there's a big, I, th I would say neoliberalism does not value individual freedom. They value controlling the masses. I would also like to say that the, since like we really need to talk more about this and we are at 12.39, so we have one minute left. I also want to mention that there are some great comments in the chat. Also, we'd like to, to say hi to Mino Taro, who also is connecting. Thank you so much for being here with us. She's also part of the faculty at Liberal Studies, and we can't wait to have you also one of the speakers with us. I'm going to do like this. I'm going to add uh, in our uh, blog uh, the chance to actually comment on this uh, question that was asked by Maggie, which I think is a great question and really brought so many of us thinking, which what should we do about this? Eh? So um, if you uh, feel that uh, we should talk more about this, like you're absolutely right, we are going to have uh, uh, in, the, in the blog, um, COVID-19 and post-human, we're going to have a section, ethics, what should we do about this? What should we do between, you know, the, 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 the entanglement of the individual and society and the planet, as, as, as Jaime was, uh, was talking about? We also have to really not think just of humans when we're talking about post-humans. We, we have to go beyond the human. What about planet Earth as well? So I think that definitely this is not the end of the conversation. This is the beginning of that. There are a lot of uh, uh, ideas that have been planted and uh, impossible practices. So uh, I know that a lot of you feel that we should not move on yet, but we do have because we have an amazing, uh, another set of speakers who are going to bring other insights to the conversation. So don't worry about it. We're going to have uh, part of the blog, uh, which I'm going to send you the link, uh, and uh, for the post-human and the COVID-19, we're going to have a session called ethics, what should we do? 
And thanks again so much, Maggie, for bringing this uh, question to all of us. Thanks so much, Kevin, for your great inspirational talk. And thank you so much, Stefan, for also your wonderful ideas. And thanks so much, uh, Jim, for doing such a good job. And also, Kevin, with the Q&A and all the questions that have been asked and also the chat. Uh, and uh, Mino, thank you so much also for um, also, uh, being part of uh, this uh, confer conference, this forum. All right, so let's move on to the second part of our um, posthuman forum. It's 12.41, so we have one minute late, but almost on time. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Christine Daigle uh, on posthuman vulnerability. Uh, she is professor of philosophy and director of the Posthumanism Research Institute at Brock University. Her current research explores the concept of posthuman vulnerability and its ethical potential from a posthumanist material feminist point of view. She also works on environmental posthumanities and issues related to the Anthropocene. Christine? Thank you. I propose that we are transjective beings. That is, we are concomitantly transsubjective and transobjective. We are always caught up in a field of tensions and forces being done and undone both by ourselves and by other beings we are entangled with, doing and undoing them as well, both subjectively and materially. We are assemblages of experiences, consciousness, materiality, and so forth. All beings, humans included, are porous, permeable beings. As Samantha Frost puts it, if there is no traffic of molecules through our various membranes, there is no life. This is also true of the traffic of ideas, affects, images, etc. It is important to emphasize that our entanglements are manifold. And Bredotti recently captured this by suggesting we are zoe geo techno framed subjects. What do I mean by posthuman vulnerability? The Latin vulner means to wound. And the usual meaning we attach to vulnerability is to be susceptible to physical or emotional injury, which assumes that the body is normally well bounded and should remain so. But I think we need to take vulnerability in a different sense. The transjective being is vulnerable since it is a body that does and undoes what it interacts with. It has the ability to wound, to affect. Being entangled in that affective fabric, our being is not only on the giving end of wounding, but on the receiving end as well. We are not self-contained entities interacting with one another. And by the way, ability here does not refer to any kind of strong, willful, autonomous agency, as we have learned from the material feminists. We most often seek to guard ourselves against our vulnerability, but in an effort to protect ourselves and become invulnerable, we do violence to ourselves. The posthuman transjective being is even more vulnerable than we thought because it is, its permeability lays at, at the very biochemical core a being whose persistence depends on transit through its own being and on its own transit through other beings. A being whose striving relies on its affecting and being affected by other beings, subjectively, socially, materially. Posthuman's vulnerability is constitutive of ourselves and other beings. It is the very foundation of life and what allows for life to persist. As such, it needs to be embraced, cherished, and fostered. The pandemic is making us discover the kind of interconnected and vulnerable beings we are. When a major disruption occurs caused by a tiny being with extensive agentic capacity like the virus, we are thrown into a state of disorientation as we need to reconfigure our entanglements. We thrive on those and we are used to go through life with a certain balance of interpersonal, material, technological entanglements, a balance each and every one has learned to negotiate for themselves. But the pandemic and the various degrees of quarantine that it introduced in our lives has shaken that balance, sometimes quite radically. With limited and real life connections with others and with the outdoors for some, we are shifting our zoage and geo entanglements to increase technological entanglements. However, this means one chunk of our regular normal experience is missing, being in the presence of others sharing the same space, smellscapes, soundscapes, perceiving the movement of bodies, encountering all non-human others. Confined to our homes, the vibrant fabric of our existence is significantly altered as we resort to technology to connect, but that necessarily fails to fill the void. No Zoom party can be the equivalent of an embodied experience of being with others. 
Folks have experienced many physiological responses to this. The stress generated by the disruption to our normal everyday experience as zoe geo techno entangled subject expresses itself in various ways, such as the widely reported fatigue. The explanations given, disruption of habits, increase in number of decisions to make, etc., all revolve around the mind. As it works more, we are more tired. But this is ignoring the largely effective way in which our existences are thrown off. Our chests feel compressed even if we know rationally that we are safe. Our guts are twisted in knots even if we just fill the pantry with essential and non-essential goods to consume. Our bodies are fatigued despite the plentiful of sleep and lesser physical activity related to staying at home. These are all reactions to having a chunk of ourselves suddenly diminished and the balance of our manifold entanglements thrown off. It can generate new affordances, but adjusting to a sudden and profound change like this takes time. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Uh, let's see, our next presenter, Jaime Delval, uh, will speak on the virus, our ally for metahumanist mutations. He's a metahumanist polymath who develops transdisciplinary projects across all arts, philosophy, technology, and activism, and has curated Metabody Forum events in over 30 countries. Jaime is a polyglot, neurodiverse, and mestiza, microsexual, and trans species, is neither man nor woman nor human, and is not in Facebook. Jaime. Thank you. Um... Oh, it seems I have to start my video again. Sorry. Yeah, there you are. Hey, thank you. As the planet accelerates via the pandemic, the pre-existing tendency towards an algorithmic governmentality, it's urgent to overcome both humanistic nostalgias of saving humanity from the common enemy and especially transhumanistic dystopias of control. Through critical posthumanism and metahumanism, I propose a triple move. Firstly, red lines against any increase in surveillance. Secondly, the planet's health as problem number one in global agendas. And thirdly, a deep mutation in sensibility towards less reductive and less dominant ways of perceiving and moving, which means also of thinking and feeling. Let me briefly expand on the three. No sacrifice of fundamental freedoms should be accepted for the sake of health. No increase in surveillance production and processing of behavioral data is justified. We were already too far. Health first, yes but for a livable life. We need to invert the idea that all-encompassing and accelerated digitization is desirable or necessary. We need to radically slow down and change the obsession with speed and quantity for a concern with quality of experience. Facebook is the kind of pandemic that we need to become immune of. Health first, yes, but the planet's health should be first. We need to understand our entanglement with both viral and algorithmic ecologies, planetary scale, and how the latter are affecting the former. Viruses have always been an ally of evolution. They are certainly not the enemy. The enemy, if anything, is the dominant human and its technologies. The illness of, on the skin of the planet, as Nietzsche might have said. Dominant species in general are the enemy that block the movement of variation that is evolution. It is a fact that pandemics are unleashed due to disruption of ecosystems by dominant species. They are a symptom of the planet's disruption. This also, of course, underlies climate change, global inequalities, is effect of centuries of colonialism. We need a gradual shift towards a more just, plural, sustainable planet where some of us will lose certain comforts that are actually grounded on an impoverishment of movement capacities and on unnecessary dependencies on disruptive technologies. In order to deal with the previous points, we crucially need the third one, to bring back into experience a lost richness. When you give your data to a company, for instance, Google Maps, 
you do it in fact for nothing or even worse for losing your own capacities to orient yourself in space and become thereby dependent or or enslaved by disruptive technologies feeding the loop i don't propose to disconnect or go back but to ontologically hack and reinvent ourselves and our technologies through unleashing our endless capacity for variation in movement and perception an unprecedented plasticity that brings back the movement of variation of evolution exceeding the reductive black hole of the age of algorithms the problem can never just be dealt ideologically the problem lies in a millennia long process of impoverishment of experience a kinesthetic and proprioceptive atrophy that has been wrongly called progress how we move is how we think perceive feel the more narrow and aligned our movements the more narrow our thoughts perceptions and affects instead of the tendency to reduce experience to fixed points of vision and clicking on screens let's mobilize a counter tendency to enrich it through proprioceptive and multisensory plasticity this is an evolutionary challenge and i'm coming close to an end from the metabody forum i and related to the 10th anniversary of the metahumanist manifesto i am offering disalignment workshops to unleash the swarming power of movement in the body what i call bi body intelligence inherited from 4 billion years of viral and bacterial evolutions let the virus be again a mutating force of evolution for a movement revolution hopefully the virus arrived too soon and people realize that a life confined in the planetary scale prison of the internet panoptic is not livable we need a planetary health movement that continually counteracts any tendency to reduction and domination in any macro or micro political spectrum we need lobbies of philosophers and activists everywhere onto hackers in determinators that infuse the movement of variation that is evolution again against the algorithmic black hole of absolute control thank you thank you Jaime. our next speaker is Emily Bauman, who will speak on stimulus serenades for social change, putting the social back in social distancing. Uh, Emily is clinical associate professor of liberal studies at NYU. She's published articles on humanitarian narrative, intelligent design, political iconography, and post-colonial studies, and is currently at work on a book on religion and media. Okay, can everybody hear me and you can see my screen, yeah? Yes. Yes, okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, I am speaking about, I'm just gonna put myself on the clock, stimulus serenades today, um, a project that I um, began um, in company with a friend. Um, and I think this is gonna be an instantiation actually of what the, the previous two speakers talked about in ways that work kind of beautifully. Um, one of the things that I, I want to look at and sort of argue today is um, four ways in which this particular project offers spontaneous and sensual, um, let's say, bodily intelligent and transjectively vulnerable um, alternatives to some of the rational fallacies and hyper-rationalities um, that often attend collective crises, especially those based upon contagion. Um, all right, so this is not... Okay, what is a stimulus serenade? Um, in the United States, we were all given um, stimulus checks if you made a certain amount and it was varied, varying based on that amount. This was given whether or not you were still receiving your uh, normal income. So a lot of people still collecting their regular paycheck were looking for a place to donate. So I came up with this idea of um, paying out of work musicians to perform outside of COVID wards of a hospital um, to offer morale and encouragement to um, patients in the ward and to frontline healthcare workers. So it's a charity event involving redistribution of resources, morale building in time of global pandemic and economic crisis. Um, so usually those giving, uh, giving the donation um, are, are people who are not currently unemployed. And, and this is a crisis here. We're, we're now at about 25% unemployment um, in the United States. So the first uh, serenade, um, happened um, a couple weeks ago, New Orleans East Hospital, um, and that was performed by the New Orleans Jazz Orchestra, 
Um, they're doing another one next week at the Lambeth House Nursing Facility, which is um, a nursing facility in the African American community that was really hit quite hard by the, uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, one of my goals in starting this was to inspire copycats across the country um, for people looking to donate uh, some of their stimulus money. Um, so I'm in conversation now with some people who might do uh, one with the National Yiddish Theater Volkswagen in um, a New York nursing home to be announced. Of course, now they're in the situation where they have to get the money, right? Um, the first two were courtesy of, of my, my, my friend's stimulus checks. Um, here's a couple photos from the stimulus performance and a quote by one of the musicians and organizers of Nojo and Orleans Jazz Orchestra. This was great for the musicians to keep the musicians working and also to show support for the healthcare workers and the patients affected by the virus. Um, it got a lot of coverage, um, AP a video, Associated Press, um, and then also um, a news article. Um, I would just flag this one title, Donation Brings a Bit of Mardi Gras to Hospital Workers. Um, and it was also covered by Trevor Noah um, on The Daily Show in his Ray of Sunshine segment um, last week. So that's been really great. Um, I'm gonna argue that this challenges four key perverse rationalities in a time of per pandemic and by, by perverse, I mean controlling, dissociated, binaristic, atomizing, fetishizing, anti-civic and collective. Um, and here are four, there are probably more. Um, the first is a false polarity between public health and the economy, which we've been hearing a lot about in the United States. It's one or the other. You open up, um, you know, or, or you shut down and you're going to exchange one for the other. Clearly, this was about finding an intersection between both of those where people out of work could be supported, but also in the service of them being able to give a gift. To, um, to those working in the hospitals and suffering in the hospitals. The second fallacy, capital accumulation, obviously that's the purpose of a stimulus check. Um, instead, it's getting redistributed. Um, it's sent, being sent out away from the individual um, and his or her consumerist habits towards um, a group. The third is uh, conspiracy epistemologies, which are privileging intention um, and, and control. And, um, and focus on denial. And we've heard all about all of these 5G bioweapon. This is a, an attempt, you know, government lockdown. It's a democratic hoax. Um, it's just like the flu, blah, blah, blah. Instead, the stimulus serenade embraces um, the randomness and the fact of this and finds a way to be affirmative in creating what I would say are celebratory ontologies that counter the conspiracy epistemologies. And then lastly, what um, we've just been hearing talked about, especially by Chris what I would call zoomomorphic life or zoomorphic with the M on the other side. Um, and this is where we have a kind of flattening of experience towards the two dimensional. Um, and, you know, in, in McLuhan's schema, I, I guess this would be really ice cold, you know, but it's not because it's not that participatory. So, in a way, it ends up being. Um, more kind of lukewarm. And um, I would just quickly say what we had um, was um, a focus on the body. We didn't zoom this in, this was physically present. There was a, a live stream on Facebook, which was quite handheld. In fact, the first four minutes were sideways because they were so inexpert at what they were doing. So really being able to kind of ca cause attention to the, to the body. And then lastly, Nojo was able to get the healthcare workers out and they danced in a tradition called the second line, which I'm really happy to elaborate further on in the Q&A. Um, and I sort of close with a question, is post-human pandemic solidarity inherently carnivalesque? Um, thank you. Okay, thank you, Emily. Uh, uh, please uh, post your questions on the Q&A. Uh, there are not very many here that we have, uh, but let's see, the one that I do have uh, is actually specifically for uh, Christine. And it's, you rightly differentiate between ability and agency, but would you place the materiality of that divide within entanglement or permeability? In other words, would permeability and entanglement mean radically different structures for you? Uh, yeah, I saw the question in the, in the Q&R box and I'm not quite sure I understand it. <laughs> Um, but but I would say that um, certainly entanglements vary a great deal from one being to the next, and that will necessarily modulate the kind of agency or agentic capacity 
um, one's ability um, to relate to others. Um, so I, I see that as, as being all very much in flux. And so one's ability, I mean, and, and it's not an ability in general, it's ability for certain specific interactions um, and, and affecting other beings. So um, I see that as, as being very much in flux. And yes, definitely related to um, the specific entanglements. All right. Um, well, uh, thank you, Christine. Jaime, there's a question for you. How should we solve the problem of the pandemic if zero surveillance takes place? A pandemic is a pandem pandemic for a reason. It is a very unique situation. More lives will be lost if we do not have some kind of tracking system. I think privacy is very important, but is sacrificing thousands or even millions of lives really worth it? A I've seen another question. Yeah, I've seen another two questions for me. Um, sh should I wait for you to read them later on, or? Uh, well, uh, well, Jim, maybe see. just read them all for Jaime, because so that we can. Yeah, why don't you, get, Jaime, get all the questions and then maybe articulate okay. the answer? Well, I've also seen one, um, which was previously maybe I'm missing even some other one, but Marcin is asking, what is your stance on the problem of an aging population in the developed world? In that case. Well, I'm not sure in what question, in what, uh, Marcin, I'm not sure in what context you were asking the question. I've just seen it. So if you can clarify what exactly so, you sorry, mean. Sorry, Jaime. No, yeah, we're going to keep it like, Jim, if you don't mind reading the questions, all of them for Jaime, and then Jaime just answer them connectedly. Ah, okay, sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, let's say for, uh, let's say, but we do have this other question. Uh, now that we rely on internet technologies more and more like Zoom, would this increase the hegemony of technological panopticon? If so, how can we resist this hegemony? Good, sure. And so I was referring to an earlier, Sure. And there is an, a previous question which I was reading myself, if you want to check it uh, for, further up. Uh, I think it oh. came in the previous conversation from Marcin. Yeah. What is your stance on the problem of an aging population in the developed world in that case, where there is no overpopulation but lack of economical sustainability. Good. So let me um, try to start uh, in the order that you read them, maybe. Um, so I never really said uh, zero surveillance. I think we already have what I actually kind of tried to say was that we already have too much surveillance. There are already plenty of mechanisms through which pandemics are being tracked. So that's first of all, what I am quite opposing is the increase in any sense of any kind of surveillance for the sake and with the excuse of health, especially the kind of measures that will stay forever like apps in our pockets that will track more and more things in an obligatory manner. So I am opposing, first of all, any increase. We already have too much, that is my other point, right? There are always ways of tracking things and of dealing with, with health problems. And what I am proposing is that what we need is to address the far deeper core problems of why pandemics are unleashed, which I was relating to the whole impact we have on the planet. That's why I say planetary health first. Um, now, if I go over to yeah, Yunus. Yeah, let's give you like one more minute because we have more questions for also Christine and Emily. Yeah. So let's make sure to keep track. And then we have another speaker and then we have announcements. So one okay. more minute and then we move on. Good, yeah. Well, uh, of course, it's, it's uh, making things worse. And uh, I have tried to um, briefly mention ways of resisting it, which are threefold. Firstly, we have to fight uh, increasing surveillance. We have to fight for putting the big matters on the table, the planetary health. And we have to, um, from our bodies, bring back a richer experience that allows us to not rely in an increasingly reductive world of clicking on screens. That's my threefold proposal. It's the minimum I think we can do. And for Marcin, um, well, uh, I'm not sure I, get, I understand correctly the, the question, but um, I think we have to take care of our aging population as part of the general program of making life uh, as it is um, as good as possible and to precisely take care of the problems of economic sustainability that have to do with this uh, continuous expansion of economic regimes that don't really care about the quality of experience in life at all. Um, which means we shouldn't care so much about uh, not having um, overpopulation uh, we should find this as a good sign and then take care of the population that we have. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jaime. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Emily and Christine, uh, how does food uh, sharing meals 
uh, food or sharing meals and types of coming together like dancing figure in your frameworks. Do you see any novel practices that could stand in for those? Uh, do you think those are vital for embodied culture? Um, I, I would say yes. Um, so short answer, um, but, um, but I think what, what, what we're seeing right now, and, and one thing I left out because I thought I was running out of time earlier is that someone made a comment about how um, we're, we're now relegated to our homes and, and in more interactions with our families or, or, or partners and, and things like that. And, and we seem to be suffering from that when actually home is supposed to be the most comfortable place for you, for, for most people anyways. So there's something interesting about, you know, like sharing meals and being in the embodied presence of others and having maybe too much of that or, or more than usual, which is what we're experiencing right now. And for people who are by themselves, like me, it's like this, this complete lack of, in, of embodied interaction, right? So th I think there's a whole spectrum of experiences that are unveiling interesting things about ourselves. It's not that we're existing in a new way, but it's making us understand how we've been living through these relations before. Yeah. Um, maybe Emily has something to Yeah, to Emily. Yeah. yeah, I would just add to that. I mean, this is the problem we're confronting, right? Is how to reconnect with, with the body and, and, and given such a dissociated world that we live in. And I think the only answer is to kind of embrace the, um, the, the inhumanity of what we are all living. And so this um, performance, I think, was one example, but I was thinking of other examples, and this relates to my question about the carnivalesque, and that has to do with masking, right? With, you know, the masquerade um, and the need to wear the mask, to cover the face, that we're denying each other even the physicality of seeing each other's faces. And I think people who are decorating masks or doing something that's kind of being creative with the surface in a sense would be one way of reconnecting with the, um, with the bodily denial in a way that becomes a different kind of bodily affirmation. That's pretty utopic what I'm saying, but I, I think, also think it's the best we can do. Mm. And Jim, yeah, we, we do have a lot of questions. Do you mind maybe reading, let's say three to four and just having like... Um, uh, let's, I, I can read a few of these. Yes. Um, uh, it doesn't... Uh, the pandemic exposed the unfairness of human social en entanglements. For example, in India, uh, poor and migrant workers suffer most from infection, mainly introduced by wealthy global travelers. Uh, <clears throat> let's see, another comment. I feel that this shift would somehow decrease the gaze somehow, ha somehow. will it? And finally, a lot of the concepts and language seem dangerously unnatural and human and void of spiritual, uh, not religious sentiments. Uh, how would you respond to these questions? Anyone? I, I think to the question of inequities and, and how um, the pandemic is experienced uh, across the globe in very different ways, I, I completely agree. What, what, what's happening, I think, is that um, the pandemic is, is, is just amplifying um, the, the, the inequities that were already present in and, and, and very dramatic ways. And, and so I, I think, you know, taking the pandemic as, as an opportunity to, to really understand the kind of world we were living in and what problems there were, um, it's providing us with a magnifying lens um, in, in some ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Emily? Yeah, I mean, a crisis reveals, and this is now being pushed uh, forward, and it's also interesting to see what's been happening in the United States in terms of other issues that are coming to the fore in terms of um, police brutality and targeting of people of color. And as our governor pointed out, um, this is on top of that being, um, the African American community being the, the community most impacted by COVID, right? So there's a, a weird way in which the injustice um, of the virus is magnifying societal injustice, right? Um, and bringing it to a, a boiling point. Right. Do, do you think that because of that link, that there will 
be any possible solutions on the horizon to both institutional racism as well pu as public health? Um, that depends on what happens in November. Hmm. I mean, you know, we haven't solved it yet. We haven't solved it under good, good circumstances, right? Rodney King happened in the 1990s, right at the beginning of the dot-com revolution when we were at our best economically, right? Mm -hmm. So I actually think it's, it's, it, it's going to take an exaggeration of, um, of the worst, uh, perhaps, for, for this to take place. We've been through how many presidencies since then? Four? Right? Mm -hmm. And still nothing has changed, including an African-American president. So... Um, you know, that's, I, I, I think that question you're at, you know, you're asking what it's going to take. That question has been asked for a couple hundred years in this country. Mm -hmm. But I think more globally, um, the, there is an, like the word interconnected has been used so much in public discourse in the past couple of months, um, in a way that it hasn't been before. So I think people are coming to very hard realizations about the interconnectedness, the fact that something that happens across the globe may impact me and my community. And, and I think that realization is, is the novelty. And yes, it comes with a lot of suffering and losses, um, but, but I think if we grab the moment and, and work on solutions and say, okay, if this is the case, then do we want to go back to the normal? And many people are already saying, and again, in public discourse, no, we don't want to go back to normal because normal was bad. Now we understand that it was bad and how bad it was. And so I think to, to action, for action to happen and for change, important uh, global change to happen, you need to have these key realizations that really kickstart the thinking. And I think we're seeing that right now. Thank well, you so much. Uh, oh, so okay, can we, we need to keep track of okay. time. It's 1.13. Uh, there are more questions from Mesha, uh, David, Patrick, Zaki, Terence, Corey. Um, we um, are a little sorry that we cannot answer all of them, but we are going to have 10 minutes at the very end of the meeting for anything that should be addressed that we have not addressed yet. So please, uh, if, you, if, you're, if your question were, was not answered, don't worry, we can always go back if you, you, know, like if you bring back the, the, the topic at the very end of the conversation. And I would also like to say that this is exactly what we are uh, bringing this forum uh, into uh, existence, because like Christine said, there is no going back. I mean, the pandemic was a shift of consciousness. It, it shows on, on so many levels all the things that are already not working and also all the things that we could uh, change because we can change. We're constantly changing. So one way to address it is also was changing our format and having a way that was, you know, much more of, a, of sharing insights together because as again, uh, as Christine said, yeah, there is no going back. Uh, that society uh, had so many uh, issues that we cannot just decide, okay, we're just, and plus there is no way we could even do it. So yeah, this is a, on some level, it's a, it's a, there is a trauma, but the trauma also allow for healing and transformation. So this is why it's so important and so special uh, to be in this together, rethinking, re-envisioning, re-understanding and, and seeing. Thank you so much again, all the speakers, all the questions. Uh, so we're going to go with the last, last presenter. Uh, he is going to be uh, giving an exhibition. So it's not uh, after uh, Danny, we're going to go into the announcements. So again, enjoy this is, don't uh, uh, listen to uh, Danny with your uh, mind, just uh, 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 enter the experience uh, like you were in a museum because he is the founder of the Museum of Interesting Things. And Jim, you can introduce uh, Denny. Okay, so uh, this is Denny Daniel, uh, and he is uh, doing a presentation called A History of Treating Disease Through Objects. And um, let's see, uh, Denny Daniel is an undergraduate, is a NYU graduate, and is founder of the Museum of Interesting Things, and brings his traveling interactive demonstration of inventions to schools, libraries, and events. Heralded in the New York Times, he has appeared on the History and Science Channel, New York One News, and PBS, and has, uh, is in over 20 publications and has given four TED Talks. Denny. So hi, everyone. Uh, once again, I'm Denny Daniel from the Museum of Interesting Things, which 
goes around the country and now virtually and shows people their iPhones and iPods didn't pop out of thin air. So today I brought a few items that have to do with the history of what I call quack medicine, all the various cures. And I always like to preface this a little bit and tell people, you know, with all quack medicine and all these bizarre cures, um, there's always some something to learn from it and often even some actual cures it's just these people purported that it cured you of almost everything from cancer to bedwetting and it clearly didn't cure you of an entire book of things and each time in history there's an invention we end up using it uh, properly and then sometimes maybe a little bit improperly um, and the focus is, uh, A, to not throw the baby out with the bathwater, but at the same time, not to believe everything you read and hear. Um, so my first item I brought is Mrs. Winslow's Soothing Syrup. It's from the late 1800s. This is an original bottle. And Mrs. Winslow was hugely popular back then. She had all these trading cards, almanacs, um, this was supposed to be for soothing babies who were teething, and it definitely would soothe them because it had morphine in it. So yeah, definitely your baby would no longer have any pain whatsoever. Uh, it was nicknamed uh, Baby Killer uh, at some point because babies would not wake up the next morning, but it was hugely popular before that. And it's one of the reasons why we ended up having the government step in and we have the FDA and all these organizations to, uh, to, uh, to um, finally monitor this stuff. So of course, then you have Marie Curie who, uh, who finds radioactivity, uh, radium. And so here is a bottle of radium water. This was produced, this one was produced in Boston. So for all the Boston people, there you go. Here's your, uh, your bottled water that you could buy that had radium in it. Uh, it was also produced in New York and all over the country. You would even go to these uh, springs and, and bathe in it and then drink it afterwards. They thought uh, this invention radium was magical and they put it in almost everything. It became one of these cure-alls kind of like aspirin. Um, they put it in almost everything, including butter. There it is, radium butter. I'm sure that's the first place you can put uh, radioactive material. And toothpaste, because clearly you'd want to put radium in your toothpaste. Uh, there's no way after this that you would ever have a cavity. Uh, you'd probably not have any teeth, so there's no way you would have cavities. Um, then, of course, we have electricity. Once we have the invention of electricity, of course, people use it properly. Um, you're able to have it on the streets instead of oil lamps. You're able to have factories open late and people able to, to have lighting in their houses. But then there were products like these, violet rays, the violetta rays, and this was a quack medical device that would use that electricity that uh, it was actually based on Tesla's uh, knowledge. And I actually have one right here. So these are the violet wands and you would turn these on and I'm actually gonna turn it on for you. So, oh, you can actually see the glow behind my black shirt. <laughs> so that had electricity going. This one was for your hair. So you would put this on your hair and it would electrocute you. Uh, everyone put your hand by the uh, computer screen and I will cure you of your coronavirus. I guess I'll be the guinea pig for you instead. So this was supposed to, this one was for the hair. So probably tomorrow I'll have an Afro. Uh, they had other ones for the ladies, for skin. Uh, I even had someone email me and tell me when he was a child, his father used to use it on pimples and burn off the pimples from his face. I, I doubt I'd ever want that to ever happen to me. Um, so once we have technology, whether it's the internet, whether it's the computer, uh, whether it's uh, the atom bomb and nuclear power, or it's morphine, radium, and electricity, some people will be like a used watch, you know, a watch salesman or, a, you know, a salesman 
and some people use it properly um, to actually advance technology. And the point is for people like us to have this fantastic discourse and figure out what the proper uses are and the improper uses are. So thank you very, very much. I hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you so much, Danny. That was wonderful. Now, we have uh, 10 minutes left. We are going to uh, open the discussion to everyone. Again, be aware there are uh, more than 100 participants. So please make sure that uh, you keep one minute, no more than one minute, could be less, but definitely no more. Julian is going to help you with his uh, blessed uh, sounds, like ding, with the, the, with the bell. Uh, yeah, that, that's the one. So if you don't mind, instead of going through the Q&A, which would be hard for me to see who is asking, uh, who wants to comment, you're going to raise your hand. So there is going to be a little uh, icon with a hand, blue hand. Perfect, I see already uh, people raising their hands. And I'm simply going to go in uh, the order that I see them. So uh, first come, first serve. So again, we have the minutes. If you raise your hands at the very end, we may not be able to uh, hear what you have to say, but we are going to have more forums. So if you have comments, anything, announcements, I know that some of you uh, are working on projects, publications, this is the time. So uh, again, one minute each, I'm going to, uh, again, go in the uh, order. So first uh, come, first serve, and we're going to start with Terence. And... Uh, Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I, I just, I, in light of everything that's been said, the whole conversation discussion, I haven't heard about 5G, uh, if anyone thinks that important. Can someone relate 5G to all that's been discussed? Thank you. I'd like some opinions. Thank you so much, Terence. Anyone, Kevin, Stefan? Yeah, I, yeah. Um, I think he might be referring to, I'm not sure, but uh, there's a conspiracy theory that 5G is causing COVID, which is absolutely debunked. Um, so scientists, there's nothing, 5G has nothing to do with any disease. Anyone else who would like to comment on this? All right, thank you so much, Terence, for your question. Uh, oh, sorry. And we go to Mesha. Hi, Jay. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure if I can also start up my video. Yes, you can, definitely. Um, uh, let's see where you. that is. Julian, would you help uh, uh, Mesha? Maybe you can start for her. Um... Maybe she could just ask her a question while Okay, she's... we can hear you. Yeah. All right, we can see you. All right, Mesha, thank can you. Can everybody hear me as well? Yes. 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 Great. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you so much for these inspiring talks. I thought all the topics were wonderful and awesome. And I just wanted to point out very briefly, I already posted that link in the chat. A very fascinating new publication from the Netherlands has uh, been released. It's available as a free ebook, and all the articles, 23 articles in the book, deal with different perspectives, call it reflections on the invisible on COVID 19. Uh, it's a free read, so I would in, uh, encourage everybody to uh, uh, open the link and see what kinds of thoughts are in there. Thank you so much uh, for this wonderful forum. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mesha. And Mesha is also publishing an entry for our blog, so you can also read her, part of her chapter there, and it's going to be published in the next couple of days. I would also like to thank Metikan King, who is the, uh, one of the editors for the blog, who is also connected today, uh, who is going to help Mesha through the process. Thanks, Mesha, and thank, thanks, Metikan. Yes, so, thank you. <laughs> thank you. We're going to go with our next um, pre, um, um, attendee, uh, Menashi Verma. Uh, I'm going to allow you to talk. Hello, I want to, hello, everyone can hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask, what is the take on emotions? Is, uh, do emotions have a place in post-human, like humans, do they have to give away their emotions to evolve into post-humans? This is a doubt that I had from the very beginning. So I really wanted to understand this part of play of emotions in uh, post-humanism or post-human. It's a wonderful question. Thank you so much, Menachi. Uh, great. Uh, hi, Christine, uh, Stefan, Emily. 
anyone who would like to say something on this? Well, I think uh, what we need to question is the concept of emotion, first of all. I mean, um, there is this broader concept of affect that some of us use, including Brian Masumi and other people like, you know, uh, there is not just the spectrum of so-called universal emotions, which is the humanistic way of understanding in a very narrow way what emotions or affects can be. There is a much broader spectrum of qualities of experience, of ways of being affected and affecting others, which has to be accounted for. And uh, I think there's no life and in fact no universe without that, which means any concept of post-humanity will have to account for the kinds of post-human affects that come about there. There is no reality without affect. And so then what I care about is how reductive are those affects or not? How open-ended and plastic are they? Like so-called universal emotions, which are the human humanistic spectrum of affects that have come up you know, over the past uh, century, evolving from biopolitics and Darwinism and so forth. It's a highly reductive way of uh, labeling a number of already existing ways of affecting each other in a mechanistic society. <laughs> so um, what about bringing in far more plastic ways of affecting one another and far broader spectrums of qualities of experience. I uh, worry, however, that the current status of post-human affects that comes up in transhumanistic scenarios of control technologies is in fact the emoticon culture of Facebook, which is a far deeper reduction of what was already going on, a far um, more problematic uh, kind of reduction, a simulation. I mean, let, let's try to keep the answers. Uh, clear. That's, that's all I want. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Anyone else who would like to comment on this important topic of emotion and the posthuman, which I think can have so many different answers. So I mean, actually, I think that this is a great topic if you're you know, writing on this, because I think there are so many different possible answers here. But anyone else who also would like to uh, yeah. say something on this? I have a comment, just yeah. a quick one. Um, she might want to look at the issue of uh, scientists trying to create emotion in uh, robots and AI. Um, there, uh, I have an article on that. Um, at academia.edu that was published about four years ago, but that's just one of many articles on this issue. Um, MIT's Media Lab has been working on empathy for robots, for instance, and Cynthia Brazil is the one to look at about that. Great. All right, so we have two minutes left, which is not uh, much time. I would like to mention that there are some uh, really important announcements in the chat. Uh, so we have uh, one announcement from, for instance, from Sumeria. We have also uh, some of the uh, people who publish in our blog who are also posted in our chat. Uh, we would like to thank, uh, we would like to thank uh, Magda Vicini, Christine Degol, Metican King, Niklish Dolakia, Dominique Leclerc, Kat Peterson, Halidon Tosaiborgia, Davide Bruno, um, Stefan Lorenz Orgner, Romy Tulli, Stefano Rozzoni, Jaime Del Val, Stefan Steinbeck, and more, um, Orsola uh, Rignani. All these people are, again, contributing to our blog, uh, Posthumans. Uh, I would like to thank all of you for this incredible conversation. It's been super, super inspiring. Uh, again, there are more uh, links. Uh, I know that Christine has uh, added a link to the um, Posthumanism Research Institute that is based at Brock University. There is uh, this uh, vlog uh, managed by Jaime Del Valle uh, on YouTube, uh, Posthumans Go Viral. Um, we have a, a, our um, website, posthumans.org. You can subscribe there for our mailing list. Um, and we have many more projects coming in. So again, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, your uh, insights, your perspectives. I thought there was a chance for a tiny announcement at the end, or, or was... Oh, okay, this was a chance, but yes, we have one minute left. So let's say anything else. At this point, everyone will have 10 seconds, but at this point, this is your last chance to write in this meeting, but we're going to have more. So last chance to write, go for it. Yeah, well, I just uh, wrote in the, in the um, chat, you can look for it, the Metabody Forum link where you can find activities related to the kinds of things I've been offering today. So if you're interested in that, look for that. We have the um, Posthumans Go Viral channel, which Francesca just mentioned. And of course, also there will be soon announcements together with Stefan Lawrence Stogner and Evi Sampanico about the online activities we want to launch with the Beyond Humanism conference that we have to postpone to next year. So there will be a lot of things coming up very soon about that, so watch out. On that, and there will be many activities related to the Metabody Forum for all the mentions I used. It. There are online events, there are workshops, there are all sorts of things. Check it and uh, write me if you have any doubts. Thank you so much, Jaime. And we also have an announcement from Yunus Tunser, who is also one of the co organizers of the New York Posthuman Research Group, and he also is in the advisory board of the Global Posthuman uh, Network. Uh, so, uh, please, Yunus, go for it. Hi, uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, 
thanks to all uh, speakers, uh, to Jim, to Francesca. Uh, my, uh, I just two things. I have a comment on emotions. I actually have a book on this subject, and I agree that we need to spend more time. I agree with Jaime. That's what I actually debated in my book on the primacy of FX, effectivity. Uh, but then the second thing is uh, my book review of Francesca's book is coming soon, belatedly. I'm sorry, Francesca. It's coming out with the, the Journal of Post-Human Studies. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, and actually, uh, I have an announcement. Yeah, so my book is coming out as a paperback um, in, uh, on June 28, uh, Philosophical Posthumanism by Bloomsbury. If you would like to write a review, you can get a free copy. You would have to send me an email. Uh, you can find it uh, through uh, the website anyway, is uh, FF, like Florence Florence, 32, 32, at nyu.edu. And you would also have to mention the journal that you will be writing for. So anyway, uh, this was again a great, 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 great uh, event. Uh, thank you so much, uh, all the uh, speakers, presenters, Jim McGride, uh, Julian Boylan for uh, um, hosting, co-hosting this event, Liberal Studies for helping us uh, organizing this, Dean uh, Julie Mosto, um, Axel, Tim, uh, also uh, the, the faculty who are connected, Mino, for instance. Also, I would like uh, one more time to uh, thank uh, really all the speakers. Uh, we have been blessed to have uh, um, Kevin Lagrandeur, Stefan uh, Lawrence Sorgner, uh, Maggie Young, uh, um, Christine Daigle, Jaime Del Val, Emily Bowman, and Danny Daniel. Uh, this has been a really wonderful beginning of the conversation. We are going to have more. Uh, we are going to also have a Chinese forum. So if you're interested in discussing post-human and uh, China, uh, we're going to have also some of the people working on these are, co on these are connected. Selena, Joanna, um, we also have uh, uh, other uh, people who are working on these are connected today. So thank you so much. Uh, we also have a Latin American forum in Spanish and indigenous languages, Brazilian. So uh, in India also we have a, a forum uh, working on a forum with, uh, with India and the post-human. So thank you so much. This is happening. Uh, COVID-19 has brought a lot of trauma, but it also brought a lot of global interconnections. Now we are all, a lot of us are still on Zoom and it uh, can also be a good thing. Apart from digital privacy that we have been uh, uh, talking of, uh, it's also nice uh, to be able to connect with so many people from all countries. And we have people connecting now from uh, Europe and, and Asia and, and Australia, United States, Latin America, et cetera, et cetera. So, Really, thank you so much for this. Um, if you want to subscribe to our mailing list and you have a wonderful day. Thank you, thank you, thank you, all of Francesca, you. Francesca, can you hear me? Yes. Francesca, yes. Uh, could you also pay attention to Sumera's announcement, uh, the call for papers? Yes, yeah, so I announced it that it's on the call for paper. Ah, ah, perfect. On the, on the chat, uh, Sumeria has added that uh, there um, and uh, I don't know so if you want to say something briefly or if people can just go through the link. Perfect, and thank you. Thanks. All right, well, thank you so much everyone. You have a wonderful day and uh, see you soon. See you, thank you. Thank, thank you, Francesca. Thank Thanks. you everyone.